you draw near to him, you have a sorrow over your sins, and you know what God will do? He won't leave you on your knees. He'll pick you up. This morning we are in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. What I want to talk to you about this morning is how to draw near to God. How to draw near to God. One of the things that stuck out to me in this passage of Scripture as I was trying to identify as many passages in the Bible as I could about prayer, one of the things that really hit me squarely about this passage, I think particularly about the timing of the year in which I was reading it, you know, you get on social media, you talk to people, and, and around the end of the year, what do people begin to talk about? New Year's resolutions. I'm resolved to do this with my fitness. I'm resolved to do this with my finance. I'm resolved to do this with my diet and so on and so forth. And we make all sorts of re resolutions and things like that. And we know how those often turn out. But I guess as I was reading this passage, it just struck me that God has already listed his resolutions for us. God has made very clear what he intends and demands for us to be committed and resolute toward. God commands us and commands us to, just as Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem and never turned back, God intends and commands us to set our face on him, to set our eyes on him and to pursue him. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That, that, that's going to sum up the entirety of this sermon. It, it's one of our verses here. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Okay, preacher, what does that mean? What does it mean to draw near to God? We'll see that here in this text. James, in this epistle, I wish that we had time this morning. We don't. But in this epistle, what James does for us is he tells us about the, the intersection of faith and works, what we believe and how we live. Right doctrine, right living. Wrong doctrine, wrong living. And so James writes very bluntly. He writes in a very candid, frank manner, and he just tells you very clearly what the Lord expects of us. And so here, what, what James is essentially going to tell us to do is that we need to stop acting like hypocrites and pursue the Lord. And that there is a contingent, direct correlation and relationship between our active pursuit of a close relationship with God and our achieving it. In other words, and when he says draw near to God and he will draw near to you, it means this. If you feel far from God, it's not because he's moved off. If you feel far from God, it's because you have wandered far away. Good news. This morning, what, what James does for us in these first five verses is James identifies, in fact, I should better say this, he gives us four indictments of spiritual adultery. Four indictments of spiritual adultery. So the things that are true about us when we are seeking after other gods, pursuing other passions, drawing away from God. These four indictments are true about us in varying degrees when we begin to walk away from the Lord. So I want to challenge you this morning to let the law of the Lord do its perfect work. When you hear these indictments, don't fight against them. Don't try to defend yourself. Just examine your heart. Be like the, the man that, that James would con commend. A man who looks in the mirror, sees how disheveled he is, and then he fixes it. We ought not like, be like those who look in the mirror and do like, anybody used to watch the Happy Days show? Few people. What would Fonz do? What would the Fonz do when he'd walk up to the mirror? He'd pull out his comb, he'd look in the mirror, and he'd do what? Do it with me. 
Hey, right? And a lot of times we can approach Scripture that way. We can go there and we can think, well, it just approves of everything I do. And hey, it's me. Well, the truth is that more often than not, we tend to wander away from God. And we need to know the signs. We need to know the indictments that begin to ring true about our lives when we wander away from the Lord. But you know what James does for us? He doesn't just indict us in those first five verses. In verses six through 10, what he does is he actually gives us five commands, five essential imperatives to humbly returning to God. Five essential imperatives, five commands you've got to heed and listen to and obey if you want to return humbly to God. And I know that's your desire. It's my desire just as well. So let's go ahead and look at the text, verses 1 through 5, four indictments of spiritual adultery. You say, what is spiritual adultery? Well, you know what adultery is. Most of us need no definition for that. Adultery is cheating on your spouse. Adultery is going and being intimate with someone that you are not married to. And so we can be guilty of spiritual adultery. When the Lord redeemed you, you surrendered your life to the Lord. You said, you are my Lord, my Savior. What what is it called when you go and serve other lords? It's called spiritual adultery. In the Old Testament, the way that it would be characterized as the the prophets would say, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they would say, you have whored after other gods. You have played the harlot. You have given yourself over to, to godless passions and cravings and desires. And why would the prophets identify that? They would identify that so that the people of God would quit wandering away and return to the Lord God Almighty. So listen to these four indictments from verses one through five. The apostle James writes, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Let's identify that real quick. Quarrels, the the way that the Greek renders there is it seems seems to be talking about ongoing feuds, ongoing Uh, fights, ongoing malice between people or peoples, is what causes these ongoing tensions of ungodliness among you? And what causes fights? Now, fights is not so much referring to these ongoing feuds. It's referring to these specific outbursts. You know, you have those moments in time where the feuds come to a head and everything just happens. And you can go back to that point in time and say, well, we really had it out right there. And and, and tempers were raised and emotions were high. And we just said things that we shouldn't have said. Well, why did it come to that point? It came to that point because you've been quarreling. But that still doesn't answer the question. Where does it come from? What, What is the origin? What is the source of our ugliness toward each other? He says this. Second half of verse four, or verse one. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Your passions. The the root word there for passions is where we get our English word hedonism. Hedonism. It it is just a a pursuit of desire. If it feels good, it must be good, and that's what I want to do. You know, sometimes it, it feels good to be mad. Can anybody attest to that? Sometimes, you know what? It feels good to bathe in bitterness. It it can feel good to sour on somebody and and just to not like them and just to figure out every reason you don't like them, every reason you don't trust them, every reason you will not give something to them and just pick them apart. Am I alone here? I'm honest, not alone though. Sometimes that can feel good. It can feel good to to just hold on to that resentment. And you know what resentment is? Resentment is a refusal to forgive somebody. Holding on to a grudge. Not relinquishing the right to retaliate. 
What's the cause of that? He says that it is your hedonism. It is your passion for ungodly things. You desire to be mad. You desire to be bitter. You desire to be resentful. You desire to be unforgiving. You desire to be a gossip and to be malicious and to be a chronic complainer. That is your desire. You say, well, that's not me. No, you're not being honest. All of us struggle with this. You ever been in a quarrel? You ever been in a fight? Every one of us have. Some are still in the quarrel. Some have been holding on to quarrels for years. Why? Because they like it. Deep down in the heart, we like it. He says, this is the cause. Your passions are at war within you. Literally, there is a, a militaristic campaign of godless cravings within you. And that's the reason that we quarrel. That's the reason that we fight. Now, listen to what he says. Jesus, that is. Because Jesus says that these, these passions and these desires that we have, we, we think about passions and a lot of times we think about sensuality. We, we think about sexual passions, but it can refer to any sort of ungodly craving. Certainly, it can, can refer to sensuality, but it can refer to all those other types of attitudes and sins that I just mentioned. I want you to be very careful and think about, think about those passions, that, that hedonism within us, because Jesus gives us a very stern warning. He gives us a description of a type of person, a type of heart in the parable of the seed and the soils, you remember that? There's four types of soils that the gospel message is cast on. And only one of those soils, the fertile ground, does the seed go deep, the roots, the roots take root and go deep, and they get watered and nourished, and it springs up and it bears fruit. And that person is a person who is saved. All the other seed that falls on the soil, that is a person that does not ultimately prove to have received the gospel. And one of these soils, listen to what it is that actually chokes out the opportunity to truly believe in the gospel. Luke chapter 8, verse 14, Jesus says, And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and the riches and, same word, pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. So there are people who hear the gospel and they go on their way and, and what happens is the gospel is trying to take root in their life and they're struggling with whether to believe or not what happens. Their love for the world, their love for sin, their love for anger and resentment and bitterness, they can't receive forgiveness from God because they cannot find it in their heart to forgive other people. And so their opportunity to believe the gospel is just washed out as long as they hold on to that hedonism and those ungodly passions. Titus, or rather Paul in the letter of Titus, he tells us that, that that's the way we used to be. That, that, that should be long and gone for us. But James is writing to believers here. Listen to how Paul describes these passions in our old life, Titus chapter three, verse three, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. You notice how Paul's saying, that's what we used to be. James is writing to believers and he says, we still struggle with it too. And that's the source of these quarrels and fights, the passions at war within us. So here's the fruit. Here's the fruit of our godless passions, our hedonism, four indictments, four manifestations of godless desires. You find yourself wandering away from God, 
You're going to be characterized more and more by these statements here. Look at the first part of verse 2. He says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. Desire is a different word than passions. It is the word where we, we get that root word for, in the Greek, epithumia, desire of the flesh. It is a disordered desire. It is a desire for pleasure that is outside of the realm of what God has provided for you. Or it is a perversion of the pleasures that God has provided for you. It is a disordered desire. James, or not James, but John describes these pleasures and these desires in this way. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. John says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the eyes, that is the disordered desires of the things we look at, the desires of the flesh, the things that we feel and want to take into our body and do with our body, and the desires or and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. But you see the interesting indictment that James makes there at the beginning of verse 2. You desire and you do not have, so you do what? You murder. You say, well, I, I've never killed anybody. That must not be talking about me. Well, I sure hope you've never killed anybody. I hope you never have to. Even in self-defense, I hope you never have to. But you know, you can... You know what gossip is? Murder of the mouth. That's what gossip is. That's what malicious talk is. Anybody in here ever been guilty of that? Saying something ugly about someone, not to their face, but to somebody else and poisoning that person's mind against somebody. What have you done? You've committed murder with the mouth is what you've done. He says, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. You're willing to go to the nth degree out of your anger and desire to have something. You want it, but you don't have it. You want authority, so you'll try to take other people down in order to get it. You want recognition, so you'll try to cut corners in order to get recognition. You desire and do not have, so you go to the nth degree in getting that. James says that is, that is a characteristic of somebody who is walking far away from God. Indictment number one, you can write this down with me. Our worldliness is manifested in sinful cravings. Our worldliness is manifested, made plain, displayed in sinful cravings. Let's make that a little more clear. If you find yourself in a place where more and more you are desiring the things of the world, you're getting mad that you don't have those things, you look back at your life and you resent that you began to follow Christ and you really want to go back and participate in those sins and you look at the commands of God and you say, you know what, you're preventing me from doing things that I really want to do. If you find yourself in a place like that, understand that what James is saying is you are wandering far away from God. That is a signpost. That is an identifier, an indictment that you are beginning to participate in spiritual adultery. You're not pursuing the things of God. You're pursuing whatever you crave and whatever you desire. So now that we have identified that, look at the second indictment here. He says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You covet. Coveting is, is being jealous of something. Be, being angry that somebody else has that job. Or somebody else has that house or has that income or, or has that spouse or has that life. And he says, you, you covet and you cannot obtain. So you fight and you quarrel. 
You, you can't find it in your heart to be happy for people that God has blessed. You, you can't find it in your heart to, to love them and say, man, congratulations on that promotion. Congratulations on that job. I'm so happy that you are in that position. You're going to do great there. You find it hard to do that. You find it hard to be happy with other people's successes. Why? You covet. Because really, in my heart, I think that I should be there. What does it show us? It shows us that we're wandering a little farther away from God. We're a little farther away from God's heart. God's the one who blesses. We covet and can't obtain, so we fight about it. And we quarrel. We, we, just, we get resentful towards some people because we just can't stand to see them doing well. We can't stand to see their successes. Indictment number two. Our worldliness is not only manifested in sinful cravings, it is manifested in jealousy. You find yourself being a jealous person. Jealous person. Always coveting things. Always wanting what's new. Always wanting what's next. Always wanting something better. Never content with what you got. Wandering the path of spiritual adultery. You know, jealousy is what motivated Joseph's brothers, isn't it? You remember reading in the book of Genesis? Joseph, he, he's the son of his father's favor. His father makes him a coat of many colors. Joseph has these dreams, and in these dreams, God has elevated Joseph above his brothers, in fact, above his father and his mother. And what do his brothers do? They don't say, thy will be done, Father. They get mad, and they assault him, and they throw him into a cistern, and then they sell him in slavery. And the only reason they don't murder him is because their father loves him. Jealousy motivates them. Your jealousy is actually what motivated the Pharisees and the scribes to hand Jesus over for crucifixion. They thought that their position in, in Jerusalem was being lost. They said the whole world is going after him. Even Pilate knew. Pilate knew when they said, we want Barabbas. Pilate knew that they were jealous of Jesus. And they wanted Jesus' position. They didn't want Jesus to take their power. They didn't want Jesus to be Lord over them. And so they went to the nth degree. They covet, they couldn't obtain, they fight, and they quarrel. In fact, they actually did murder. Look at this, the third part of verse 2. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. You do not have because you do not ask. So worldliness is manifested in, it's manifested in our sinful cravings and in our jealousy. But this one's a little bit different, isn't it? He says, you do not have because you do not ask. You know what the indictment is? Our worldliness is manifested in prayerlessness. Prayerlessness. You, you're wandering far away from God if you just don't ever want to talk to him. Shouldn't that be obvious to us? When's the last time you spent more than dinner time or 30 seconds at lunchtime saying good bread, good meat, good God, let's eat? When's the last time you, you spent some time on your knees to speak with the Lord? Maybe that's hard to identify. There's been times in my life where that's been hard to identify when I've really spent time on my knees. You know what's true about that? What, what's true about me in those times? What's true about me in those times is that I'm wandering off into spiritual idolatry. I don't really care what God thinks. I don't really care what God wants. If I did, I would go to him in prayer. I, I get to the point where I feel like I've got this figured out. All I need to do is make my own smart moves, and I'll be okay. That's worldliness. That's spiritual idolatry. That's looking in the mirror and saying, how great thou art, O Lord my God, when I an awesome wonder. Our worldliness is manifested in prayerlessness. But listen to the call of God. 
Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. That makes you want to talk to God, doesn't it? It makes me want to cast my burden on the Lord, knowing that if I am righteous in his eyes, he will never allow me to be removed, knowing that he will sustain me, knowing that I'm not God and I don't have to be God. And so I'm not going to be characterized by prayerlessness. But that's not the only indictment of spiritual adultery. You find yourself being moved around by desires and sinful cravings that are not in line with God's will. You find yourself motivated by jealousy, just can't be happy for other people, You're just miserable in your existence. You find yourself not praying, not talking to the Lord. Or maybe you do pray. And maybe you pray and you pray and you pray and you just don't get what you pray for. That'll tell something to you. That, that will reveal something to you about your spiritual state. Listen to what James says in verse 3. He says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So spiritual adultery is not only characterized by prayerlessness, but it can also be characterized by, get this, by ineffective prayer. If you're praying prayers all the time that God refuses to answer positively, it is because you are not praying in God's will. If you are not praying in God's will, you are not thinking in God's will, you are not desiring God's will, and you must not be very close to God's will. You've been wandering the path of spiritual adultery. You ask God to do what you want, and instead of saying, your kingdom come, your will be done, my prayers are governed by, Lord, today I've got this thing coming up. Lord, today I've got this. I want this in my future, and me and my and all this and all that. But you notice that's not how the, the Lord's prayer begins. The Lord's prayer begins, and it's all about God. When you talk to the Father, talk to him about himself. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's all about you, God. Our worldliness is manifested in ineffective prayer. Praying things that are so far from God's will. Why? Because we're not in tune with God's will. We're far from him. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. Listen to what John says very clearly. He says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, toward the Father, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Prayers that get answered no ought to tell us something about the way we're thinking and about the way that we're feeling. Now, our worldliness is manifested in sinful cravings, jealousy, prayerlessness, or maybe even ineffective prayer. I tell you, when I read this, I, I, I made sure that I... I crafted those indicting statements to include myself. I had originally put your, because James seems to be talking to his reader, but I thought, I'm not James. And when this comes out of my mouth, it's going to sound like I'm not including myself. Believe me, I'm including myself in this. It's our worldliness. It's characterized by all of these things in varying degrees at various times. And if we're wise, we're going to look into that mirror and see where we are disheveled and we'll turn from it and we'll fix what's wrong. Now, listen to what James says in verse 4. He says, you adulterous people. That's actually one word, one word in the Greek. It is, it is the vocative formulation of the word that says adulteresses. 
The vocative is a way of looking someone in the face and calling them by name. Here, James calls us a name. He looks at God's people and he says, adulteresses. He says, this is why you are acting this way. Because you have departed from God. You're not loving God. You're being like the church at Ephesus. You are leaving your first love. You are committing spiritual adultery. He says, adulteresses, do, not, do you not know that friendship, philia, that is love, close affection, friendship with the world, get this, is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What a dangerous place to be. Spiritual adultery does not make us walk agnostically towards God. It makes us walk antagonistically against God. You see the difference there? We think sometimes that when we, when we walk away from God and we wander away and we stew in our bitterness and our ugliness and our malice and our jealousy and our prayerlessness and our ineffective prayer, we think that we're just wandering off and we're just over here in this agnostic area where, yeah, you know, we just don't really think about God a whole lot. God doesn't think about me a whole lot. You know that that area does not exist? What James says here is that when you wander away from God, you are not walking away into agnostic territory where God just doesn't exist. He says, you are walking away into enmity with God. That when you walk away from God, you always do it with your heels dug in, ready to fight against what he truly wants for you and me. Friendship, love of the world. When, when, when James uses that term cosmos, it's the same way in which John uses it, same way in which Paul uses it. It's talking about the corruption of this life, the sins that we're tempted with, the sins that we commit, the sins that are abundant and rampant in this world. And James says, don't you know that friendship with the world is not a safe place to be? It sets you up as an enemy of God. And you know what ought to make us fearful about that statement? It's not that we are setting ourselves up as enemies of God, but that we have actually just put God in the position of our enemy. He's standing against us at that point, fighting against our own creator, our own maker, the one who sent his son Jesus to die for our sins, and we raise our fists and we say, no. That's a dangerous place to be. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I don't know if I could say any better. I don't think I could. Then the Apostle Paul does in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18. I want you to read this, hear this, and listen to how it is very, very clear. He says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That means don't attach yourself in any way to unbelieving people. If you are a believing person, there is no area in your life that you give the intimacy of your heart and body to an unbeliever. Why? Why? Listen to what he says. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Those, those, those are not competing ideas or competing states of life. Those are antithetical. They are antagonistic towards one another. Light and darkness, righteousness and lawlessness. What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial, that is the devil? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? You know what that's talking about, the portion? You know what the portion of a believer is? 
It's the kingdom of God, everlasting life, inheritance as a son or daughter of the most high God. You know what the portion of an unbelieving person is? It is hell. We share no future portion with one another. So he says, don't intermingle yourself. And what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them. I look forward to that day. And walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore... Go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. And touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. He says, because that's your future, because that's the direction of your worship, because you walk in light, pursue God, walk away from ungodliness and do not tie yourself up with unbelievers. James says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. It makes you an enemy of God. And then he says, verse 5, or, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture, that is the Old Testament and the New Testament, you take all the verses that talk about the jealousy of God and the Spirit of God, and you see them together, this is the verse that summarizes it all? Or do you suppose it's to no purpose that the scripture says, he, that is God, yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? You know, in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter six is one of the, one of the passages that talks about this very clearly, verses 14 through 15. Listen to the jealousy of God. He says to the people of Israel, you shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you, for the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. The God that we serve is a jealous God for us. Now he spoke those words to Israel. How much more now we who bear the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts. What did God do for you to save you and bring you to this point? God sent his son Jesus into the world to live a righteous life and then to die the death that we deserve. He raised him up from the dead and ascended him to his right hand and he sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts as the guarantee of our portion, our inheritance until the day we receive it. That's what God did to set you apart and to purchase you. Don't you think God is jealous over you? You married folk, you understand this. Even the thought of your spouse with another person breaks your heart and infuriates you, doesn't it? I mean, just the thought. And if we, being evil, have those type of righteous indignations, how much more so God? who put his spirit within us. So why, why would we go off and play the harlot with the world? Why would we go off and, 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 and play the harlot and give ourselves to, to pornography and to bitterness and to flirtations and to anger and to resentments and to quarrels and fightings? Why would we go and do that? We're playing the game of spiritual adultery. Come on now, look at verse 6. But he gives more grace. Amen. Amen. But he gives more grace. Our sins went deep, and his love went deeper still. That's what he's talking about. But God gives more grace. Time and again, God will call you back to himself. He will say, return to me, and I will return to you. Draw unto me, and I will draw myself unto you. 
Don't wander away in this adultery anymore. Don't wander away from God. He gives more grace. He'll take you back. He wants you to have a close relationship with him. He wants you to draw near to him. God wants you to draw near to him so much so that he condescended from heaven and came to you. So none of us can say that God has pulled himself away. God's the one who initiated it all by grace. He says, draw near. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, it's a quote of Proverbs 3, 34. God opposes the proud. You set yourself at enmity. God opposes the proud, but what does he do? But he gives grace to the humble. Verses 6 through 10, what you see here, five essential imperatives to humbly return to God. Listen to what, what James says to us. He gives you the roadmap of repentance. He gives you the roadmap away from worldliness and the way to draw near to God. Do you want to draw near to God today? Praise God. Brother Eric wants to draw near to God today. Do you want to draw near to God today? If that's your heart, listen very carefully to what James says. It's not complex. It's just difficult for us to humble ourselves. Listen to what James tells us. Verse 7. Submit yourselves to God. You know, in these next few verses, he gives you 10, 10 imperatives, 10 commands wrapped up in five statements. Submit, hupotasso, set yourself under, subjugate yourself to God, is what he says. You know what he's talking about there? You know, when you, when you walk in your passions and you walk in ungodly desires, who is functioning as Lord of your life? Yeah, you are. You're functioning as the captain of your own ship. So what is the first corrective that James gives here? Relinquish the captaincy of your life. Just submit yourself, therefore, to God. Give yourself back to him. Say, God, I don't run this show. I never have. I tried to take the reins from you, but it, it, it's yours. Just give it back. I was standing there at enmity with you. Now I just let it go. I, I give it to you. Simple to understand. Submit yourselves to God. Imperative number one, essential imperative number one. Return to your rightful position as subordinate to God and his will. Return. Return. To your rightful position as subordinate to God and his will. He says, submit, therefore, to God. Look at the second thing he tells you to do. Resist the devil. Look at the promise attached to it. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You remember Luke chapter 4? The devil is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And what does Jesus do? He resists the devil. And what does it say there at the end of that text? It says the devil left him. He resisted him. Jesus didn't just sit there and say, oh God, would you just deliver me from the devil? Would you deliver me from the devil? Lord, just put a, put a hedge of protection around me. No, what did Jesus do? Jesus actively and proactively resisted the devil. He was tempted to sin, and what did he do? He fought back. Resist. Friends, listen, you will not passively, accidentally fall into righteous living. It just won't happen. So, so guys, the next time you're tempted on the computer, do this, real spiritual. Close the computer. Turn off the phone. Give it to somebody else. Ladies, the next time that you are tempted to gossip about somebody, and men, you're not excluded from that either. And women, you're not excluded from the first one either. 
And the next time we are tempted to gossip, you know what we need to do? It's going to be real theological here. Just don't say anything. Just stop. Resist the devil. And what's the promise attached? And he'll flee from you and leave you alone. He'll get tired of messing with you because you're putting up a fight. And there are plenty of people in this world that they won't put up a fight. And Satan's forces are limited. He's not going to continue to waste his time on you. So resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You'll not always be living in the darkest hours of temptation. You will if you continue to indulge in it. But if you want to walk in the light, walk in the light as he is in the light. And we will have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son will cleanse us of all of our sins. There is an active nature to our pursuit of righteousness. So he says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil. Imperative number two, resist the devil's temptations to lead you astray to sin. So elementary, but it needs to be said. Resist. Actually take the initiative to fight back. Don't hope yourself into holiness. Walk into it. Take it by force. When he says resist, you know that's the same kind of attitude that we used to have against God, resisting him, setting ourselves in opposition. He says, nope. Set yourself in opposition the other way. Instead of fighting against God, contend on the same side and contend for righteousness. Look at what else James says. He will flee from you. Verse eight, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That doesn't say pray that God will draw you close. We, we, we sing that there's a song in a, in a, a worship chorus that we've, we've sung before. There's nothing wrong with it. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. Well, that's true. The Lord does draw us close to him, and the Lord never lets us go. But this is an active verb telling us to draw near to God. So how do you draw near to God? Let me tell you, there are a number of means of grace that God has provided for us to draw near to him. Number one, get in the word. Get in, read God's word. You want to draw near to God? He's talking. Actually, he's spoken. Go to him. The Lord, speak to me. Lord, speak to me. I have. Draw near to him. You want, you want to have a close relationship with God? Start reading your Bible. Get around God's people. You want to be, come Holy Spirit. Move in this place. You want to be around God's spirit? Get around God's people. Because guess what? The Holy Spirit lives inside them. <laughs> so fellowship with God's people. Don't forsake the attending of church. Be with God's people. Eat with them. Dine with them. Spend time with them. Fellowship with one another. Sit under biblical, faithful preaching. Experience the gifts of the Spirit, and God will draw near to you. Is there any, any mistaking as to why when you, when you gather with God's people, you read scripture, you sing his praises, you hear the preaching of God's word that you leave and you say, man, I felt close to God. Why is that? You are taking advantage of the means of grace that God has given for you to draw near to him. And when you go home, read your word, praise the Lord, fellowship with believers. Imperative number three, if you wanna draw near to God, Draw near to God through every means possible. Every means possible. Don't just avail yourselves of Sunday mornings. Don't just avail yourselves of Sunday school. You know, there are some people who come to Sunday school and then they just leave. Their loss, our loss. Missing out on the means of grace that God has provided for his people. You know, there are some people that come to service, but don't go to Sunday school. Guilty of the same thing. Not taking advantage of the means of grace that God has provided for you to draw near to him. You want to draw near to God, take advantage of every means possible to do so. Listen to how the prophet Isaiah says this. Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 7. Seek the Lord 
while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Listen to this, though. Second half of verse 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Ooh. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's talking about two aspects of our person. It's talking about our outer life and our inner life. Cleanse your hands. The things that you do with your body, if they're not honoring to God, stop it. Very clear, very point blank. And he says, purify your minds. Purify your hearts, rather, you double-minded. So don't only stop doing what's evil outwardly. You know, a lot of people can hide evil and do a lot of it inwardly. Jesus says that the Pharisees were like whitewashed tombs. He, he says they look all white and bleached on the outside and clean and neat, but inside, what are they full of? Dead men's bones. So James says, cleanse the outer man and clean the inner man up too. Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts so that your heart truly loves God truly desires faithfulness and holiness. And that way, you won't be double-minded, saying, I love God, but not truly loving him. That was a chief criticism of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. He said, these people honor me with their lips. Their hearts are far from me. What does God want us to be? He wants us to be true outwardly and inwardly. Imperative number four, purify your actions and hearts rather than being a hypocrite. Purify your actions and heart rather than being a hypocrite. What, what you say you ought to be before God outwardly, be that on the inside. Make the decision to be that person. And when, when, you, when you sense your inner self, your inner dialogue going away, going astray, say, no, I'm resisting that temptation. I will take every thought captive. Purify your actions and heart rather than being a hypocrite. Listen to verse 9. This is rough. He says, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Wow. That, that, that hits heavy, doesn't it? Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. When we were walking in ungodliness, what were we laughing at? We were laughing at our own actions. You see what I did? You see what I got away with? You, you, you know how bad we were this weekend? We laugh about that. And, and James says, no. Be wretched and mourn and weep about the things that you used to celebrate. You know, when we, when we place our faith in Jesus and we display that in baptism, what are we displaying when we go down into the water? You know what we are actually displaying? It's a funeral. And what do we do at funerals? We're in a wretched state. And we weep and we mourn because there has been a death. And it breaks our heart. James says, feel that way. Feel that way about your sin. Rather than saying, man, I wish I could go and do that some more and get away with it. I wish it wasn't wrong because, man, it feels so good. And he says, no. In your heart, hate your sin. Mourn over it. Act as though there has been a funeral. And that old person that you used to be is dead and gone. And you don't want to be that person anymore. And you look in the rearview mirror and you remind yourself of who you used to be. And you say, that breaks my heart and I will never be that person again. 
Imperative number five, embrace a deep sorrow over the sins you once lived in. Embrace a deep sorrow over the sins that you once lived in. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, the apostle Paul says, for godly grief, godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Friends, if you will feel a godly grief over your sins, it will lead you to repentance. You will hold fast to the salvation you have in Christ. A worldly grief doesn't grasp on to the salvation of Christ. A worldly grief looks at past actions and just weeps over them and says, I can't believe that I was that person. I can't believe that I am this person, but I can't do anything about it. This is just me. And so the easiest way to deal with the rottenness of me is just to do away with me either numb myself through narcotics or alcohol or take my life because I just can't deal with me. That's a worldly grief. That's the kind of grief that Judas had. That's why he went and hung himself because he couldn't deal with his sins. That's not the godly grief that Peter had. Peter had a godly grief that went and ran to the empty tomb to pursue Jesus and be restored. Friend, if you will truly hate your sin and draw near to God and say, God, I can't deal with my sins on my own. I can't fix me on my own. I got all these regrets. I just give myself to you. Could you deal with my sins? And you know what God's done? He's already dealt with our sins. He had his son Jesus die for our sins. And our condemnation is nailed to the cross. And we sing that. My sins are nailed to the cross and I bear them no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. That is a godly grief. And if you'll embrace a deep sorrow over the sins you once lived in, you'll draw near to God. But without, without a godly sorrow for your sins, you can't draw near to him. Look at verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. You get on your knees before God. You put yourself back in that subordinate position. You draw near to him. You have a sorrow over your sins, and you know what God will do? He won't leave you on your knees. He'll pick you up. But God opposes the proud. If you refuse and you want to stand lockstep, fists up toward God, people that don't bend their knees. Psalms chapter 2 says that the king will break their kneecaps. But no, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Think with me. Luke chapter 15. There's a, a son, two sons in the home, and, and the one son, the prodigal son, you're all familiar with him. What did he do? He set himself up as an enemy of his father and says, I wish you were dead. I'm jealous of what you have. I covet what you have. I want it all for myself. Give it to me now. And he sets himself up as an enemy of his father. And then he goes to a far country, far away from God, far away from his father, far away from the people of God. And he finds out that the wages of sin is death. And he finds himself bankrupt, living with the pigs and faring off worse than the swine. They won't even allow him to eat the slop that's given to the pigs. And as he lies there in the muck, he comes to his senses, doesn't he? And he says, my father's hired servants have it better than I do. I know what I'll do. I'll go back to my father. I'll apologize. I will humble myself before my father and I'll ask him to make me a slave in his home. A deep sorrow over his worldliness. A deep sorrow over his sin. And he drew near to his father. Listen to what it says. Luke 15, 20. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion 
and ran and embraced him and kissed him. You see the correlating relationship? Let me tell you this, friend. If you've been walking far away from God and you want to draw near to him today, if you will begin to make your way down onto your knees, God will meet you. He'll meet you there. God will be at this altar before you get here. God will be halfway down if you'll just meet him. If you'll just draw near, he'll do it. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's not complex. It just takes humility. It takes a willingness to say, I have wandered far away from God. Do you remember that old hymn? I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home. Sing that chorus with me. Coming home. Close your eyes and pray it. Coming home. Nevermore to roam. Open wide thine arms of love. Lord, I'm coming home. Would you pray with me?